Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. Good to be here with you. Will you open your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 2 in the New Testament, verse 13. Mark 2, 13. This morning, we want to pray for um, a couple of families. Last Sunday morning, two things. Last Sunday morning, um, Daniel and Tammy were here, and you know, and William and Tammy uh, is expecting another baby boy, and he was born this week, Coulter. So Coulter Wayne Ward was born um, healthy, and then Daniel and his father. In law Jeff came to men's study on Friday, which was a blessing. We prayed for them. So we want to pray for them, but just an announcement so you know. Tammy had her baby and all is well. Thank God for that. And then Philip was here last Sunday morning, and I've talked to a number of people, and that was me because I talked to him last Sunday morning, and we said, and a number of people have said, hey, I just talked to him Sunday morning. And Monday, um, Philip went into the hospital with pneumonia, here at Sutter, and he ended up being flown down to Santa Rosa um, early Tuesday morning, and he's been there in ICU. And Lana, his mom, is here with us today, and with her permission, I'm sharing this, and we're going to pray. He's been on our prayer chain. Everybody's been praying all week. The Lord has been raising him up. He's doing better, and um, he was on a breathing machine. He's off of that. He's breathing on his own, and uh, he's fighting pneumonia, but he really still needs our prayers. And so uh, this is powerful, all of us here right now praying together, and it's the Lord who heals, and he's been so faithful in answering prayers. I'm looking at people this morning, and praise reports are coming in and things the Lord's been doing. And so let's pray together right now for Philip, and um, if you'd join me. Lord, you're so good, and we want to thank you and praise you, Lord, for little Coulter being born healthy, and we pray for him, Lord, for continued growth and strength and for Tammy, Lord, for healing after delivering him and just bless that family, bless their family as they have extended family visiting, Lord, but we praise you for that. We thank you and praise you, Father, for raising up Philip and strengthening him and that he's going forward and progressing and right now as Mary Bell, his wife is there with him in the hospital um, and Lana, his mother, is here We pray for Isaiah, his son, Lily, his daughter, for all of them, Lord, and we just thank you and praise you. You're the healer, Lord, and we're just all together agreeing and asking for our dear brother, Lord, that you would completely heal him and strengthen him and raise him up in a mighty way. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us, for your word as we look at you in the word this morning, Lord. We're drawn to you, Lord Jesus. We need you. We thank you, Lord, um, that you rose from the dead and your presence is right here in this room with us this morning. And Lord, we bow our hearts before you. Lord, we quiet for a moment and we hear little voices back there. Bless them. Bless the teachers back there with them. Pour out your Holy Spirit back there, Lord, as they learn about you and also in here, Lord as our hearts look to you, and we ask this in Jesus' name, and all God's church said, amen. Amen. Okay, well, last week for Mother's Day, we were in Proverbs 31, we studied that. The week before that, we were here in Mark chapter 2, and we saw the story of the paralytic and his four friends who couldn't get to Jesus, so they made the hole in the roof and let him down through, and the Lord saw their faith, and he forgave them um, of his sins, and he healed them. And, and that brings us to our study today. So we're just going to look at five verses. And this story is also in Matthew and Luke. And we're going to look at it there. It's short. And we're going to read these. And um, so Mark chapter 2, verse 13. Let's go ahead and read it. It says, Then he, that's Jesus, went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the, tax office, at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. 
And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now we're here in Mark. I'm going to ask you to turn right now to your right to the next gospel, Luke chapter 5, verse 27. Hold your place there in Mark. We're coming back in just a few minutes. But this is the same story that Luke tells, and we're going to read it because if the same story is in different gospels, you'll get details. Um, we will get details, uh, and that's what we're going to do here in Luke some things that we didn't just find out as we read Mark. So in Luke 5, 27, same story, same happening. It says, after these things, he, that's Jesus, went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he left all, rose up, and followed him. And we want to notice that because we didn't get that back in Mark. It says that he got up and followed him, but notice here, um, it's important. It says, so he left all. All. And we'll talk about that. And then what we didn't also find out in Mark is what's in the next verse, verse 29. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. We knew he was there for dinner, but now we know that Levi gave him a great feast. And there were a great number. We saw many twice in our reading of Mark. It says, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and the Pharisees um, here's something we didn't get either, complained. Say so they asked a question we read, you know, why is he eating? Um, and, but now we see their heart. The, their scri the scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Well, Mark had said, they asked him, why does he, Jesus, do that, right? And now he says, why do you? And obviously that's, gonna, um, that's not a contradiction. Um, the you here, why do you? It's going to be you and Jesus. Why do you, all of you disciples in Jesus, eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now go back to your left past, if you would, Mark, and go to Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. So Matthew 9, 9, same story again, and we're just going to read two verses here. So Matthew 9, 9, same story, and uh, it says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named, notice, Matthew. Now the, in Mark and Luke... He's called Levi, and here it's Matthew, a man named Matthew, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. So we'll stop reading there, but what we want to notice here is just in verse 9 that um, Jesus sees a man named Matthew. Now, Levi... We read that in Mark, and we read that in Luke. Levi is better known by his Greek name, which is Matthew, and we see that here. Same man, right? And so um, we're going to stop there, and let's go back now to Mark chapter 2, verse 13, and we'll pick up our story. Since Matthew, we just read it, in his own gospel, calls himself Matthew, as he writes about the story, so will we today. We're going to just, if we read Levi or whatever, I'm going to use Matthew because we're all more familiar with, with that, and everyone is. And so we're going to refer to him as Matthew. So Levi is Matthew. Matthew is my son-in-law. One of my sons-in-law, he did the announcements today. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, Matthew, that name means gift of God. And... Um, you know, had the Lord blessed Laura and I with three daughters. And uh, had we had a boy, guess what we were going to name him? Matthew. So that wasn't God's plan, but he had an even better plan. 
He gave me a Matthew. He gave me a son, a son-in-law named Matthew. Amen? Gift of God. Isn't God good? He's so good. So we're going to call him Matthew. Um, so let's read it again. 13 and 14, Mark 2. Then he, Jesus, went out again by the sea, and all the multitudes came to him, and he taught them. And when he's done, right, verse 14, as he passed by, he saw Levi, Matthew, the son of Alphaeus. Where is he? Sitting at the tax office. He's a tax collector. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. So first, a little bit about tax collectors. Um, it's like the IRS, right? And uh, Due to the Roman occupation, right? They're under Rome. They're paying taxes to Rome. The Jewish people required to pay taxes. So they're up in the north in Galilee. The responsibility to collect those taxes up there fell to Herod Antipas. He was the Tetrarch. And then what he would do is he would sell those franchises. Like if you buy a McDonald's franchise or whatever, you could buy to, to the highest bidder. He would sell a tax franchise, whoever wants to pay the highest. So, if that was you and you purchased a franchise, then you were required to meet a minimum quota of taxation for Rome. They wanted so much money, and anything beyond that that you charged and collected, you got to keep. And so, that arrangement made tax collecting a very profitable business venture for anyone who wanted to make a lot of money but had... Um, very low ethical standards, right? And you were living for money. So these tax collectors continually would look for ways to squeeze extra money out of us, extra money out of people, right? And so lots of taxes beyond the poll tax, which they would pay, and then they would pay income tax like us, and that was about 1%. They'd pay a land tax, like property tax, and that would be one-tenth of all the grain and one-fifth of all the wine and fruit but above that, taxes were levied on the, the transport of goods and produce, um, the use of the roads, just using the roads if you crossed a bridge, and other miscellaneous activities. I just wrote down here probably anything you can think of, right? We're going to tax. And uh, that's still the way it is today. Um, and so those other miscellaneous things that they could tax... Um, were really susceptible and prone to corruption because they can easily make that higher and then they'd have enforcers and they would collect that under the threat of harm. So notorious for exploiting people, tax collectors, charging more than was necessary and reasonable. And then if you were unable to pay, they would loan you the money for your taxes at really high interest rates. So they were working it and, uh, of course, all the people, all of us would see them as what? Because they were Jewish. They were, you know, fellow Israelites, uh, total traitors. That's how they were seen to their own people. So they extorted money from their fellow Jews. They're supporting Rome, right, the corrupt infrastructure of foreign oppression, and they're lining their own pockets. And so their money was considered tainted, and it would defile, they thought in their minds, anyone who accepted it. They were considered unclean, kept and barred from uh, attending the synagogue, excluded from all religious fellowship. And if something was going on in court, they couldn't testify. They weren't allowed to be witnesses in court. So the most despised people, tax collectors, right? and uh, among the most despised. And so Matthew, here in our story, tax collector in Capernaum, that's where Jesus's headquarters are. He spends a lot of time there. Our story's been there so far. He would have been one of the most familiar men in uh, Capernaum. Everyone knows the tax collector, Matthew, and he would have been among, if not the most hated man in Capernaum. Well, here comes Jesus. And he calls Matthew, follow me. And in doing that, he commits a scandalous act. And that's what we got to realize. We can read it and go, yeah, follow me. Hey, no, this was like, right? Just like when he healed people, um, we saw that it would spread like wildfire and everybody started coming and all the people gathered. Something like this. He just went by the tax office and told Matthew, of all people, follow me. 
And he got up and he followed him. And that would have gone like wildfire, scandalous act. It would rival um, his touching a leper. You never touched a leper, right? You didn't even get near a leper. But we know in Mark 140, weeks ago, we saw that Jesus actually touched a leper and healed him. So this would have sent shockwaves throughout all of the people in Capernaum when they heard that Jesus had commanded Matthew to follow me. And no reputable rabbi would do that. They wouldn't want any association. Not, we want to stand next to a tax collector. Um, and so this was scandalous, you guys. People right now, when this happened, the word went out. They're stunned. Oh, my gosh. And so self-respecting Jewish people, especially the religious leaders, would never want a tax collector as an associate or a follower. But aren't you glad that our Lord Jesus shatters all the stereotypes and and don't you just know that he planned this and the Lord purposely, it wasn't just like your life and mine, the way things happen. He goes before us. He loves us. He purposely has his path cross Matthew's path because he loves him and he loves you and I and he's ahead of us and he's taking care of everything. And so purposely crosses Matthew's path. So I just think it's possible as everyone um, is shocked, right, stunned, that Matthew probably must have been the most shocked person of all, and probably nobody was more surprised by Jesus than Matthew was, that he would come by and stop and say, follow me. Isn't that glorious, uh, our Lord Jesus? Well, Kenneth Wiest is in heaven now, and we thank God for men who spent their life. He spent his life. He was a Greek scholar. So we read, right? Jesus says, follow me. Well, he spent his life studying the Greek language. And just a few things he says. He says when Jesus said, follow me, that this was more than an invitation from Jesus, but it was a command. It is not would you like to follow me? I extend this invitation to you. It is, this is the meaning, start following me and continue as a habit of life to follow me. So it is an invitation, but it's much more than that. It's a command. Isn't that how God should speak? And Jesus is God, yes. So he says the command was not merely follow me, it was follow with me. Our Lord did not merely command Levi to become his follower. He welcomed him to a participation in his companionship. And this with me companionship was not of a single file nature, like we used to walk into school, one following after another. It was a side-by-side -side walk down the same road and this blessed fellowship is for every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? So today, the Lord, with you and I, just like Matthew, we need to see ourselves as Matthew. And he's like, I want to walk with you every day, side by side. He lives in our hearts. What a Lord. We love you, Lord Jesus. Now, we read as we began how Jesus went by and Peter and Andrew and James and John were fishermen and they were fishing. And what did he say? Follow me. And they left their nets and everything and they, and they followed Jesus. Now he says to Matthew, follow me. But we know from all the gospels that those fishermen went back to fishing now and again, right? And even after Jesus rose from the dead, well, this is a crisis for Matthew because unlike the fishermen, a tax collector who left and abandoned his position could not later return to it. It was final. So no going back. And uh, Matthew is turning his back on his former way of life for a completely new one. And we already read, when we read in Luke's account of the same story, it said, um, so he left all. Remember that? We said he left all. He got up, no going back. Well, that's supposed to be us too, right? Our sins, we, we confess our sins, we turn, you turn and we're from our life of sin and we're following Jesus. And we want everyone to know about our Jesus, right? So verse 15, let's look at it. It says in Mark 2, now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house, Matthew's house, 
that many, and the Holy Spirit tells us many twice, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and it says, and they followed him. You know what that means? More conversions. So it wasn't just Matthew. Because he went and he did this with Matthew, it opened up the floodgates and the doors for all of these people like Matthew. And this is what the Lord does, and he still is doing it today. So more conversions. So what happens is that Matthew, in thankfulness and gratitude, what does he do? Right out front, makes his public identification with Jesus. I'm all about Jesus now. He gave him a feast in his own house. What's beautiful is that he had a feast for Jesus and for others. So you see right? The fruit of the Spirit right away. And he serves the Lord right away as soon as he is saved. And Jesus is the guest of honor. Can someone serve the Lord right away as soon as they're saved? Yes. Someone gives their heart to the Lord today. You come up after service, you pray with a man or a woman up here. You say, I want to know the Lord, and you give your heart to him. And then anything's going on. We're picking up chairs. We're doing anything we're vacuuming, we're doing anything. And you say, hey, you know, can I help? I'll help do that. Can they? Yeah, totally. That's the Lord, right? And um, so Matthew wants to honor Jesus and to share Jesus with his friends. Stop. Isn't that beautiful? He wants to honor Jesus and he wants to share him with his friends. When we first get saved, we go home, we tell all our family, all our friends, right? And uh, do we need to get rid of all our friends when we become a Christian? No, not at all. We want them to know Jesus. Trust me, they'll get rid of us, right? When we talk to them about Jesus and we want them to get saved, they will get rid of us or they'll get saved. And it it takes care of itself. And so um, big feast, very appropriate. Shouldn't the day of salvation be a day of celebration? Yes. Now remember, the Jewish tax collectors are what? They're excluded from the synagogue. Jesus would teach a lot in the synagogue. We saw that he taught in the synagogue at Capernaum. So in verse 15, it says, Many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus. In other words, many people who were excluded from where Jesus usually went, and they couldn't hear him there. And you know what? Kenneth Wiest, Greek scholar in heaven again, I love this. When he says many tax collectors and sinners also sat with Jesus, he wrote an expanded translation kind of in the Greek, you know, what it would mean. And he says it means this. Many tax collectors and sinners stained with vice and crime were dining with Jesus. And you know what? I stopped when I read that. I love that because that's so, how, how, so often how I feel. How about you? I feel stained. And sometimes I feel like that stain can't be removed. And that's not true, is it? Because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses a man and a woman of all sin. And he's faithful and just to forgive us of all sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I love that Jesus is sitting right in the middle with people stained with sin. And that is us. So again, twice we read in verse 15, there were many of them. So it must have been, I mean, look at this room here, right? Matthew's house, he's wealthy, right? He's a tax collector. He's making a lot of money. He might be the wealthiest person in the whole of all of Capernaum. So he had to have had a large hall or a large open court to fit this crowd of people. And um, it would have been a real quick meal like sometimes we have. It would have been a prolonged meal. It was a feast, plenty of time for conversation and discussion. So imagine Jesus sitting there, right, drawing everyone to himself because he's God and with his love, drawing them. So what the Lord is doing is deliberately on purpose, associating himself with the outcasts of Jewish society. And they couldn't go to the synagogue, so here he is with them. 
And um, that whole crowd, right? No respectable rabbi would have broken bread with these people, let alone even attend that event. And if you had sent out invitations, which Matthew probably didn't do, uh, the righteous Jews of the community would not have responded to an invitation to come to the house of a tax collector. And so this whole feast, many people was filled with fellow tax collectors and others who fell into that category of sinners. And so it would have included fellow tax collectors like Matthew, known criminals, thieves, thugs, enforcers, and prostitutes, harlots. Now, a couple of points. The Lord's using this association with one man, Matthew, right? For the purpose of outreach. And you guys, he wants us to do the same. So in other words, the outreach happens when we go out from here. And, um, and he wants to use us the same. And there's also a simple principle here, um, very basic, to reach the lost, we have to be with the lost. To reach the lost, we have to be with the lost, and we must share the gospel. Now, you know what I love too? We read Matthew's account. He didn't say that he had a feast. He didn't say that he had Jesus and all these people here. It was Luke who put that in his gospel. Matthew wrote about the same thing. Now, this is the day Matthew got saved, right? Well, Matthew wrote his gospel in A.D. 60, so it's at least 30 years later that Matthew wrote his account. And just to stop for a moment and go, he got saved this day. He's already serving Jesus. But do you see the work of humility that the Holy Spirit would have done in that man that when he wrote about the story, he did not include, led by the Holy Spirit, that he was the one who had the feast in his house and that he gave this great feast for Jesus. But Luke did and told us that. And so we see his humility there. So looking at verse 16 in Mark 2, it says, And when the scribes and Pharisees notice, saw him. Okay, there's something there. Saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners. They said to his disciples, how is it that he eats with and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? So they saw him, and that's because they would not actually enter Matthew's house. No way, because they felt that they would be contaminated if they did that and that they would defile themselves by going inside. So they're more than likely where? outside and they're looking through the open windows or the open doors and they saw what was going on. So they're on the outside because they don't want to get dirty, right? Or unclean and contaminate themselves. And they're saying, why are you guys in there with these people who are stained, right? Now, a couple of points. Our Lord Jesus did, listen, not seek fellowship with sinners in their sin. And he didn't affirm them in their sin. And he wants us to outreach too, but he doesn't want us to do that either. We're not going to fellowship with sinners in their sin, and we're not going to affirm them in their sin. We're going to do what Jesus did. And what he was doing is he was always seeking their salvation and offering his grace and his mercy and extending to them to their forgiveness. Right, And so there's going to be times when we're not going to go with people of the world and what's going on because it's just out of control and not a good idea, but there's going to be a lot of times when he's going to want us to be right there in the middle and not seeking fellowship with them in their sin and affirming them in their sin, but wanting to point them to Jesus, just like we see the master doing here. Now, here's the thing. Uh, Complete extreme opposite ends. People who hate each other and there's no way in the world they'd ever be together. And our Lord Jesus... (laughs) brought people together to serve him together who are completely opposed to each other and they hated each other. Well, who is that? The fishermen, right? The other disciples and Matthew, the tax collector. If it wasn't for Jesus, they wouldn't be together. That would have been impossible. They're together because both of them are interested in him and everything's revolving around Jesus. And that's the work he does. Yeah, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, we know Matthew. He's the one who collects our taxes from lucrative fishing business in Capernaum, the biggest city 
uh, and the fishing village or town on the Sea of Galilee. And so lots of tax revenue coming in. They knew Matthew very well, and they probably hated each other, all of them. He collected their taxes. And so um, Matthew's considered to be the worst of sinners. You know, uh, uh, because a prostitute or a harlot, you know, would sell themselves and the people considered that tax collectors had sold themselves to foreigners. And uh, so they were considered the worst. So imagine like wildfire, the scandal and everything stirred up. Jesus created it. But you know what? We got to think that's all going outside. That can even be going on inside with his disciples because it's like, oh, yeah, that quick. Oh, Matthew, love you, brother. Hey, welcome to the family, right? No, man, God's got to do a work in us and, and he's still working in all of us, right? And we got to work all that out as we follow the, whole, the Holy Spirit. And uh, according to the guys outside, the scribes and Pharisees, there's no hope for a man like Matthew, no hope at all. But don't you just know, let's stop right here, that sitting in there, the one throwing the feast is a completely different man, right? Like this, Come in one day, Jesus, faith in Jesus, completely new, brand new, different man than he was before. And he doesn't even have time to show everyone that and prove that to them yet. But immediately out of his heart, he wants to honor Jesus. He's throwing this feast. He wants his friends to know Jesus. He's bringing everybody together for the Lord. But the Pharisees outside and the scribes still see him in the same way. And it's very possible that the disciples inside also still see Matthew in the same way, you see. And so the Lord's always working on our hearts. We notice in our story, instead of going directly to Jesus, the Pharisees went to his disciples and they tried to undermine their confidence and loyalty in the Lord. In other words, man, he's still the same to us. He's still the same to you. What's he doing? Aren't you on our side? You see, the enemy gets in there just subtly. And that's what's going on. If you sat down to eat with somebody in those days, that was powerful. It was regarded as a sign and a pledge of real intimacy. You want to be close to that person. So what Jesus is doing here, everyone regarded as a scandal. He's sharing a meal. That's a statement of social acceptance and friendship, and Jesus wants to be close with a tax collector. You see, it's blowing their mind is what's going on. But really what's going on, what they think is a scandal, is in reality the ultimate demonstration of God's grace towards us, utterly undeserving sinners, because our Lord Jesus identified all people as sinners. Now, again, get the picture in your mind. There's men standing outside, the religious leaders who are saying the people stained are inside and we can't even go in there because they're so bad. And we're on the outside and those are tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus, the truth, right? I'm the way, truth, and the life, sees everyone in the room and everyone outside the same. And, and, and what's the truth? <laughs> Everyone's a sinner, right? And so these guys outside, Right? And so we're going to get into that. Jesus, we're all unworthy, undeserving sinners. The men, the religious leaders outside are unworthy. Um, but the story shows us that no sinner is beyond the reach of God's grace. And Jesus was willing to save even a hated tax collector. So they say, why does he and why are you with him eating with these tax collectors and sinners, and that was not a sincere question. And that's because remember, we read that they, it said they were complaining. So they weren't saying, hey, I got a question, teacher. I just want to know. And it's a sincere question, right? And you know that when you all used to keep asking question after question of the teacher so there wouldn't be time of the test and it would get close to recess, <laughs> that those all weren't sincere questions. Oh, I know you were doing that. You were doing that. 
Sometimes it worked. Yes, that was so nice. I think they knew we were doing that. But anyway, I loved it when that happened. So um, not a sincere question, right? Um, but you know what's there too? The in, they're, they're so filled with pride. There's an inference kind of that we're out here. We are, we're the leaders, right? Um, if, if Jesus is who he claims to be, wouldn't he be seeking their company, our company, the religious leaders? You know, it's interesting when Jesus was born in Bethlehem and the Lord sent wise men from the east, Gentiles, to come visit him and worship him. And they followed that star, which wasn't a real star because, remember, it came and it stopped over the house where he was. And uh, it was the Shekinah glory of God. Go outside tonight with your neighbor and look at the stars above and decide whose house is it over. No, it's over my house. No, it's over my house. Well, how do you do that? A star, right? So uh, supernatural, the glory of God. And they're led by that. But when they got near Jerusalem and Bethlehem's on the other side of Jerusalem, it disappeared. So they come in and they say, where is he going to be born, the king of the Jews? And Herod gets all upset. He calls all the wise men and they say, Bethlehem, and then they leave on their own, and what's amazing is no one goes with them. Nobody goes with them to find the Messiah. You know why? Because God isn't going to come to Gentiles. He's going to come to us, right? We're the leaders. He's going to come to us. That's what's going on here, right? So they're thinking, why would Jesus lower himself in this way. They're all outcasts and untouchables in our society, and we treat them as if they're lepers. Why is he lowering himself with these people? So, five questions. Number one, are we, are you and I, are we a friend of sinners? Number two, do we spend time with people who don't know the Lord yet, seeking to introduce them to him? Number three, do we love sinners, care for sinners, and reach out to sinners? Number four, do we know someone like Matthew, who most people think is not worthy of a call to follow our Lord Jesus Christ? Do we pick and choose who we share the gospel with? And lastly, which people do we think Jesus would hang out with today? Good questions, huh? Wow. Now, let's look at verse 17. Jesus is God, and he hears all that is said. He even knows what they're thinking. And we saw that when, in the story of the paralytic. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And now we know that's everyone there. He's calling everyone there to be saved. Now, Jesus is not suggesting that the scribes and the Pharisees who are standing outside were already truly righteous and that they had no need for repentance. He's saying just the opposite. He's describing how the Pharisees saw themselves. In other words, he's saying, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He isn't saying that there's anyone righteous. You have to believe in him. He's taught, what he's referring to is those who think they are based on their own performance, and he's talking about them. Well, hold your place there. Um, no, nah, don't hold your place. We're not coming back. Let's go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 9, if you would. Luke 18, 9. So we know our story so far. We're going to see our story again right here. Same characters. Jesus would tell parables, a story to help us understand. So in verse 9, also he, Jesus, spoke this parable to some. Now, you guys, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. You know who that is? We already know, the scribes and the Pharisees. So he spoke this parable to those outstand, standing outside of Matthew's house who are trusting in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, 
Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Well, that's our story this morning. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. They're in the temple. Notice he prayed with himself. So he's self-sufficient, self-reliant. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. So this man feels he can approach God on the basis of his own goodness and righteousness, his self-righteousness. In verse 12, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, so he's recognizing his unworthiness, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So he's standing afar off. He knows he's unworthy. He won't even raise his eyes to heaven, again, knowing he's unworthy. But you guys, he beats his breast like this, you know, with his fist. And that's an outward sign of mourning, of remorse, of contrition, of repentance. And he's marking, so to speak, the source of his sin, his heart. You know, Lord, right? And he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So he comes to God with empty hands, no merits and no claims, excuses and explanations for his sin do not enter his mind. Comparing himself with others is out of the question. He's a tax collector, and he's completely emptied of self-reliance, self-righteousness, and he's relying completely on God's mercy. And what does Jesus say, ending the story in verse 14? I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Do you know, um, the Lord said, you know, those who are well don't need a physician, those who are sick. And it's been said, for Jesus to refuse to associate with sinners would have been as foolish as for a doctor not to associate with the sick. So no one is too bad to save for the Lord. But the problem is many people think themselves to be too good to need salvation. I'm good enough to go to heaven. So you must see yourself as lost before you can be saved. You must know you're spiritually sick before you can be spiritually healed. And so the Lord, when he says, I didn't come for the righteous, he's saying no one's righteous. and didn't mean um, righteous in God's sight. He's talking about people who are righteous in their own esteem, in their own mind. So... Here's the thing. Um, they're outside Matthew's wall and they despise the people inside and they think their attitude is right and that they actually are reflecting the attitude of God. In other words, we are right on with God because this is how God feels as they're watching Jesus inside Matthew's house, right? But instead of rejecting um, and discarding outcasts, because they thought God loves the righteous, that's us, the good people, but he hates the sinners. And that's us. We're good. We love, you know, we, we hate these people inside. But Jesus is inside with outcasts, broken people, dysfunctional people. He embraces them, loves them, teaches them, heals them, mends them, ministers to them, and he saves them. And so picture again Matthew's house. It raises a question. Jesus is inside and his actions are he's welcoming sinners and the Pharisees are outside and the scribes and their idea of God that he hates sinners, it raises a question, what is God's attitude towards sinners? So you guys, let's check it out. Let's go to Luke 15, 1, if you would. Let's go to Luke chapter 15, verse 1. And we're going to see this. It's the only time Jesus tells three parables in a row. And he does that because altogether these three parables are really just one parable. It's a single answer, a single reply to the question concerning God's attitude towards sinners. And all three of these parables, really one, have the same thing, theme, lost things. So all of them have a four-part structure. Number one, something or someone is lost in the story. Number two, 
It is sought after with an all-out effort, number three. It is found, and number four, there's a great rejoicing as a result with a huge party. Kind of sounds like the story in Matthew's house. So Jesus says in Luke 15, 1, Then all, notice all, the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And see, this is a different occasion, but the same thing. And the Pharisees and scribes complain, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, you know what? It's been said, no more wonderful thing was ever said about the sinless son of the living God. It says, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Isn't that beautiful? So just stop for a minute, getting ready for the message and studying this, that ministered to me. He still does. Sometimes we get saved, we hear the message, we get saved. And careful, guys, because we're totally accepted and we belong. But then we begin to relate the Lord based on our performance again and we think we're acceptable when we're perfect and we're not when we're not. And, uh, and we begin without even realizing that we're relating even as believers already saved to the Lord that way. And this man receives sinners and eats with them. And the Lord would, would just say, hey, you know, I want to be with you and I'm going to take care of it and just draw near to me, right? Um, so first he tells the story of a searching shepherd. And the scribes and Pharisees are there, large crowd of people, the disciples. Jesus grabs everyone's attention. They immediately take personal interest in the story because of what was value, valuable to the one in the story who lost it. So he says in verse 3, so he spoke this parable to them saying, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one, Matthew's just one, right? If he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it, you don't give up. Because once a sheep is lost, it can't find its way home. Now really vulnerable, in great danger. And Jesus knew that because of the value of what had been lost, that anyone listening to him that there that day themselves would have left the 99 safely and go to seek that one valuable sheep. And they would have each kept searching till they found it. And he knew that. So he tells them this story. So they're listening intently. So our Lord isn't willing to accept the loss of one human soul, one sheep. Verse 5, and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. God's joy is his natural response to the recovery of someone lost. Shows the supreme value God places on each individual, and he loves all people, you and I, individually and specifically. In verse 6, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. In other words, genuine joy must be shared, for I have found my sheep which was lost. You know what? Who's telling the story? I just wrote a note here in my notes. Who's creating the story? Jesus. Who is Jesus? God. Didn't Jesus say, everything I say and do, I'm following the Father and I receive from him? So this is God's heart and mind towards sinners, right? But stop for a minute. When, he, when the person finds the sheep and he brings them home, rejoice with me for I found my sheep which was lost. Stop. That's God. In other words, Jesus is saying, rejoice with me. Jesus, with me. Jesus, think of Matthew and Jesus back in the home, surrounded by everyone. Rejoice with me. We have, we're having a celebration. See, this is the heart of God, and we can't even begin to touch, right, how much he loves us and, and how much joy there is. Verse 7, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Who are the 99 just persons who need no repentance? These are 99, listen, self-righteous persons, the scribes and the Pharisees standing outside the window looking in, and anyone else even today, right, who don't think they have a need to repent of their sins. And Jesus is not teaching here that the Pharisees were righteous in God's sight. He is teaching that they were righteous in their own sight. That's what he means by 99 just persons who need no repentance, those who think they're good enough to go to heaven, and we know that no one is, right? 
Do you remember the Lord said to them one day, he said, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you because they're willing to, right, confess their sins and say, yeah, I need a savior and I'm not good enough to make it. And by the way, that's every person ever born. So now he's going to teach the very same lesson a second time. And he uses a woman with 10 coins, verse 8. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses, notice, one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together. Let's have a party. Same thing, saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Again, Jesus is telling the story. What he's saying is rejoice with me, Jesus, over a saved sinner. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, sometimes a woman would get married and these coins would be her dowry that she had been given at her wedding. And they would take these coins, put them on a headband um, that could be worn on the, on the forehead, right? Ten coins. And so to her, this wasn't only, it had a monetary value, but it also had an emotional value, right? A sentimental value. And these coins signifying, very important, the bond between the bride and the bridegroom and the faithfulness that was involved in such a bond. So she loses one of these. Jesus is telling the story. So he's got their attention because a sheep, oh my gosh, we will go get the sheep. And now, oh my gosh, if a woman lost one of her coins, how valuable is that, right? So they're listening and she does a full house search. Now they had dirt floors or a stone floor. And in order to keep the dust down and to overcome the cold and dampness, they would put, they would cover it with straw so to find a coin that had fallen on the floor, you got to remove the straw, sift through it, sweep the floor. A lot of labor, right, to find it. But the coin was of such value that it was considered worthwhile and you didn't give up till you found it. And Jesus said in verse 10, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God. And you guys, it literally means that joy arises and it means it's the joy of God himself. And so Jesus in that house with Matthew, surrounded, right? It's so appropriate that they're having a celebration. As a celebration is going on in the home of Matthew, that day that he got saved, a celebration is going on in heaven, in his new home where we're going, right? So how about the day you believed in Jesus and received him? Do you remember that day? The angels threw a party in heaven. That's what the scripture is teaching. And there's parties going on in heaven all day today. Amen. And the angels, they just respond to the joy of God and, and God's joy, right? When we come to him, will you come to him this morning? If you have never given your heart to him. And if you have, will you come to him again? And will you realize he wants to sit with you the way he's sitting with Matthew? Oh yeah, but I failed him. That happened to me like Matthew, but since then I've been trying to be really good and walk in the power of his spirit, but I failed him and now I feel like he doesn't want to be near me. Not so, I hope you're getting that. I hope you're being drawn to him as he draws himself, draws you in this morning. Third time, verse 11, then he said, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood. Two sons. Now, you guys, I'm running out of time. I want you to listen. We always focus on the prodigal son, and we're going to read it. The whole point of the story is the prodigal son. Who would the prodigal son be? The tax collectors and sinners that are in Matthew's house, right? But he had two sons. Jesus didn't say a man had a son. He said he had two sons. And you know the whole point of the parable of the prodigal son, Jesus told it. It's rare, very powerful, but usually that's what's taught. The main point of it is the second son, the older brother who's at home, who didn't leave, who's really good, supposedly, right? But doesn't really love his father and is bitter with his father. And by the way, neither son loved their father and wanted a relationship with him. Sometimes we think, the older brother, the one at home when the prodigal left, is the Christian who's, you know, no, both were unsaved. That's the meaning in the story. Jesus is telling the story of the prodigal son 
for the sake of the Pharisees and the scribes who are listening. And what you have is two sons. And the prodigal who goes off, who's the obvious sinner, right? And then ends up coming back. Well, that's the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the sinners. But the supposedly good son who stays home, who's that? That's the guy standing outside the window. The scribes and the Pharisees who think they're good, but they're not. Verse 13, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. You guys are describing the misery of our sin when we're living in sin. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, and by the way, this is probably the finest example of what repentance looks like in the New Testament, what we're reading right now. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. Now notice, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. And notice you guys, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. It says when his father was still a great way off, he saw him and had compassion, and he's ran. So that means the father was far from his own house. He wasn't at home watching. He's, he left his house. He's out searching diligently, like looking for the sheep, like looking for that coin, right? He's left his, uh, and he sees his son a great um, way off and um, to a vantage point where he can see his son return at the earliest moment. Imagine you leave your home, you go up to the hill, and you go, if he's coming home, this is the place where I'll see him first, as soon as I can, right? Like we see him coming through the checkpoint at the airport. That's the first time we can be with him, right? And he, he can see him coming. So picture there's the father who represents God, because it's all about the attitude of God towards sinners. The whole teaching today is Jesus is with Matthew and these people. And you got the religious people outside saying, we're good enough, and what are you doing? And the Lord's saying, you all need me. You're all sinners. Well, the father in the prodigal son story, the two sons, he's standing in the middle of the road. That represents God. There's no telling how long he's been standing there looking towards the horizon. When he sees the silhouette of his son, he runs as fast as he can towards him. You guys, that's God. God is always swift to forgive and in a hurry to save, and his arms are open to us this morning. Now, check this out. In that culture, in that day, it was a total lack of self-respect. Don't you have any self-respect for yourself, right? For an affluent landowner, the father, to run. That was undignified. Especially if it was in public view of the villagers, and that kind of display would have been humiliating to run. But what's beautiful is the father could care less because <laughs> he loves, right? So we see Jesus came, humiliated to die on the cross and save us. The foolish old man in Jesus' story is clearly God. Remember, Jesus is the one creating the story. Jesus is God. The father falls on his neck and kissed him, and it means he kissed him fervently, and it means he kissed him again and again. And remember, Jesus is telling the story, and he wants us to know his heart and the heart of God. Verse 21, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He recognizes the younger son. There's nothing in me that would commend me to my father, if he does restore me and grant that to me, it's going to be have to be on some other basis than on my own worthiness. Well, that's Matthew and everyone in the house for that celebration and that feast that day, but it's not the scribes and Pharisees standing outside the window who are self-righteous. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. 
For this my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Again, really good definition of God's grace. When the person, I write it with a capital P, think of Jesus sitting in the house with Matthew and everyone that day. And think of this story of the prodigal son. They're the same, right? Grace is when the person from whom I have a right to expect nothing, gives me everything. That's God's grace. When the person, God, from whom I have a right to expect nothing, gives me everything. But you guys need to know, the Lord loves the scribes and the Pharisees. He died for everyone, and he's trying to win them. And you know, after he died and rose again, many of the leaders of the Jews believed. It says many of the priests were saved. And so he's planting seeds and he's drawing them and he's always drawing everyone. Now, the part we kind of read at the end and go, okay, yeah, that's the ending. That's the whole story, the prodigal son. The whole reason the Lord told the story is the scribes and Pharisees who are standing outside, right? So look at verse 25. Now his older son, Jesus could have just told the story with one son. Well, the prodigal is Matthew and all the sinners in the house. These are the scribes and Pharisees. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. Sounds like Matthew's house, right? They're watching through the windows and the doors. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he, the servant, said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Remember our Lord sitting in Matthew's house, eating with the tax collectors and the sinners, and they're celebrating. Verse 28, But he was angry and would not go in, just like the scribes and Pharisees outside of Matthew's house. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him, That's what Jesus is doing exactly with them in adding this part to the story. He's pleading with the scribes and Pharisees to see their need and get saved. Verse 29, so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. Can you hear the Pharisees? And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. What he's saying is, I am deserving of salvation by my own works and merit, and I'm self-righteous. That's... But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. In other words, the tax collectors and the sinners don't deserve salvation. That's what the older son is saying, in effect. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. In other words, it's yours by grace through a relationship with me. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. The father couldn't force him. He had to choose to come in. And, um, and so the elder brother clearly represents the scribes and the Pharisees. They were there when Jesus told those three parables. And, um, but here's a question. What did the older brother do then? We know the younger brother came home and now he's inside with, in loving relationship with his father and they're celebrating and he was lost and now he's found. What did the older brother do then? Question, what will the scribes and Pharisees do now after this story? And our Lord Jesus left the story unfinished and did not say what the outcome was. He purposely stopped when he did in the story because they still needed to be saved. And he was drawing them to himself. So the last thing we see in the story of the prodigal son, the two sons, is the father still pleading with the elder brother who is still pouting. And by leaving the story unfinished, Jesus is letting them know that the door is still wide open. And he's given the Pharisees a warning and an invitation to enter into salvation by believing in him. 
if you will do what the younger son has done and just acknowledge your own sinfulness and unworthiness. It would be like the Lord shouting out through the windows all of a sudden, everyone be quiet, have the party stop. And they're all looking in the window and he, and he just says, why don't you come on in and join us? But to do that, you'd have to see yourself that you're the exact same as they are. And that's what the Lord's trying to do. And he's trying to do that in our lives too. So it's all important is how we see God in his heart of love. And then we'll see ourselves correctly. We'll see our, ourselves as being in that house and needing him. But then what will happen is we'll also all see all other people correctly through the eyes of the Lord and through the truth of his word. And um, so here's the thing. When you read the story with me, prodigal son, were you in the story? Was I? Because if we can read it and not identify ourselves in it, then we're missing the point of Jesus' message because it's a call to repentance and it applies to prodigals. That's immoral and outcast sinners. And also Pharisees, that's moral, respectable hypocrites to both of them. Absolutely everyone. So everyone's in the story. Did we see ourselves? Because we're in there. We're either one or the other. And so um, the Lord would tell these stories. So to close, do you know and do I know, right? Uh, just so much need a reminder of the incredible value and worth that you are that we each are to the Lord. He puts together a search and rescue effort to find us. We are his lost sheep. We are the lost coin. We are his lost child. And he came to the cross to rescue us. But listen, now he calls us, everyone in this room, every believer, to be part of his search and rescue team. He's telling us to go seek the lost. It's what really matters. And every disciple of Jesus should be searching for what is lost so that no effort is too great. In all three of the parables we just read, there was an earnestness, a thoroughness, and a persistence until what was lost was found. And um, so we're going to worship the one risen from the dead who's in our midst right now, and he's the one who came to find the lost. And what we saw was his heart again this morning. It's his heart for you and I. Let's embrace him as we worship him, then allow him to live his life in and through us and go out and live his life and reach out. And, and may our lives resemble Matthew. What a great example, right? That's what it's supposed, Christianity is supposed to look like that we're living in the world, we're not of the world, but we're living in the world, and they are being drawn to him because he lives in us. And so what a savior we serve. So Lord, we know you're here, Lord Jesus, our risen savior. And there was a celebration going on in Matthew's house, Lord, and and we are here, Lord, in your house, and we're going to worship you right now. So we tell you we love you, Lord, and we thank you for saving us. And if you're here today and you want to give your heart to the Lord or you need prayer for anything, there will be men and women up front here afterwards. Just come up and talk with them and pray with them. Amen. Let's worship.